Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. The steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship God. God's word assures us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in humility and faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Loving God, you have drawn near to us, but we stray and wander away from you. You have called us to love one another with the kind of love that Jesus has shown us, but we have been too afraid to take that risk. We have doubted your presence with us because we have our own expectations about who you should be and have made you in our own image. Forgive us, O oh God, and fill us with such a sense of your love for us and for all the world that we might live the lives you have intended us to live. Lives of compassion, purpose, service, and humility, always looking to Christ, our guide and friend. Hear this good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, even Christ prays for us. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. 
The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus, in whom we find life. seated. As we continue our worship of God this morning, several prayer concerns that I would bring to your attention. Uh, Carol O'Brien Shackelford continues to receive care at the hospital following a heart attack she had late last week. Um, she had to have a stent repaired, but she is in good spirits. Uh, of course, we are praying for Carol and for George and their families. Donna Hardy has also been in the hospital this week to treat an infection. Julia McCracken's mother has been back in ICU. She's been sick for several weeks. We've been praying for her. She is now struggling with um, some pneumonia, and so we want to pray for the McCracken family. And then we learned this morning that Pamela Maxey fell this morning and um, is on her way to the hospital to receive care, and so we hold her in our prayers as well. Mindful that there are other prayer concerns on our hearts and in our minds, let us go to God now in prayer. We lift our eyes and our hearts to you, O God, because you made heaven and earth, and we are sure that our help comes from you, and that you watch over us and that you keep us every day of our lives. And so, O God, we ask that you would listen to us as we pray for those who are in need of your help and your safekeeping this day. We pray for those who are sick or who are recovering from surgery or injury, that they might experience healing and comfort. We pray for those who are grieving dear ones lost recently or a long time ago, and for those who seek to be a support to friends and family in the midst of difficult times. We ask you to watch over those who are heavy-hearted, for those for whom the winter is a difficult emotional season, for those in the grips of anxiety, for those who feel more fear than love. To each of these, O oh God, grant comfort and assurance and peace. And we pray these things knowing that it is your desire for each of us to live abundant, full lives. And we ask that your grace would make it so. O oh God, our keeper, we lift to you all who go without shelter in the rain and ice this day. We lift to you those without food or without friendship this day, that they might be cared for and comforted, and that we might find the courage to show forth your justice and love in reaching out to those in need because we are particularly aware of all the ways that each of us stand in need of care and comfort. We praise you that in Christ we are strengthened for the life to which you have called us, a life of service to others, a life marked by kindness and patience, a life of sacrificial giving and trust. Oh God, thank you for all the blessings we receive from your hand, for the gift of new life, for the sense of vocation and purpose, for the grace you extend to us to call us again to ourselves when we have lost our way. We thank you for new opportunities, for healing, and for direction. We praise you, O oh God, for this church community and for the work you are doing in and through us. Give us all creative spirits and open and willing hearts to hear your Holy Spirit guiding us and challenging us to become the people that God would have us to be. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us to each other so that we can care for and support and challenge one another in the life of faith, and so that we can pray together using the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Can you hear me now? There we go. If you didn't hear me before, kids, come on down. Good morning. Yeah, that's Miss May. She's a big girl. Hey, friends. Anybody know somebody up here named Anna Dixon? If you know her, raise your hand. No, none whatsoever. I'm going to ask her to wave. That's her. You know what we're doing today? This is called a service of installation. Installation. Big word. I had to look it up. Let me tell you what I found in the dictionary. An installation for a person, not for a machine or an appliance, an installation for a person is a ceremony in which someone is put in an official or important job. A ceremony where a person is put in an official or important job. So basically, what we are doing today is installing the Reverend Anna Dixon into a very important job. Her job to us is we are officially asking her to help us learn about the love of God. We're officially asking her to help walk with us on our journey to understand how to love God. Because you know what that does? Loving God helps me love you better. Helps me love you lot better, and you, 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 and you. It helps me love everybody better. So that's a really important job. I don't know. Take a look at her. Can she do it? I'm thinking so. I'm thinking so. I think there's a whole lot of people who believe that Anna is here because God asked her to be here to help us. Love God so that we can all love each other. All right? So... You're going to go to Children's Church, some of you, but you're going to come back in time for the installation. I wanted you to know what that word meant before you actually listen to what happens. We are asking her to be in a very important job to help us. Got it? Installation. All right. Can you pray with me? Let's pray. I'll say it, then you say it. Dear God, thank you for Anna and for all those that help us know you. Help us love one another as you love us. Amen. Thank you, my friends.
the Lord does answer prayers. Fran, thank you so much for agreeing to take me home. <laughs> Will you bow your heads and open your hearts for the prayer of illumination? Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Exodus 33, verse 7 through 8, and 11 through 23. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each of them at the entrance of their tents, and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then he would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, would not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and you will proclaim before you the name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cliff of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to say just a few things before I begin in earnest. So if there are any of you out there who are time watchers, just this is prelude. Don't count this against me. First, I'd just like to say it is a great honor, truly. It's an honor to be among you. It's an honor to take this historic pu uh, pulpit. It's truly humbling. I'm so uh, glad to be a part of this commission. I'm glad to be here to honor Anna and your congregation. Uh, I think this is a very exciting time, not just for you as a church, but for our denomination. And I just want to say one more quick thing just about the text. The text is not an easy one to read. It's circular, and, and there's a lot of he saids going back and forth. And just to situate it, we find ourselves here in chapter 33 in the wake of the golden calf debacle, which has resulted in God's withdrawing the divine presence from the wandering 
Israelites. So we began in verse 7 with Moses' memories of the days before the calf, before the severed relationship. And then we continue, and as he is wont to do in, in subsequent verses, Moses takes fight against God's announced absence. Okay, now you can start your timers. When I was a little girl, my grandfather owned a hardware store in Due West, South Carolina, which is about as backwoods as you can get. During the summer, I would spend week upon week there, and, and it was kind of old school shop where everything was everywhere. Boxes of nails lined the floors or, or screwdrivers or replacement wheels for your wheelbarrow. And at the very back, near where there were on, always peanuts warming on a furnace, there was a giant box of Hershey bars. Now, for every day I went into work, or as my mother more accurately spoke of it, you have got to get out of here, you're driving everyone crazy. For every day, my grandfather gave me a Hershey bar. But one wasn't enough for a growing girl, so I would usually sneak an extra, or two. But even then, I was smart enough to know that I couldn't throw away more than one wrapper, so I would hide the others. And I got really creative in my hiding to my credit. You know, I would, I would dump out an entire box of nails. And I know that people in my profession are prone to hyperbole, but I would, I'm just so very honest. I would pour out a huge box of nails onto the floor of this hardwood shop, and I would just start lining them. Bed of nails and then some Hershey's bars. Bed of nails and then some Hershey's bars. I am certain that my grandfather knew exactly what I was up to. After all, the chocolate always seemed to disappear at a disproportionately high rate whenever I was around. But I was quick enough not to get caught, just on the edge of his vision, lingering a beat too long and then dashing away like a lost thought, so close you could almost retrieve it on the tip of your tongue and then poof, gone. Now Moses had had some good days with the Lord. Back then he would go into the tent of meeting and he would speak with the obstructed deity as one does with a friend. He was respected then, Moses. Every time he entered the tent, the people would stand up in deference to his authority and to God's overwhelming presence. They were sure of their leader and they were surer of their God. Now Moses used to take the tent Verse 7 reads, he used to, but that was before the calf. Since then, everything has gone upside down. God has removed the pillar, his very presence, effectively refusing to accompany the Israelites any longer. The people, penitent though they may be, they don't stand up when Moses enters the tent anymore. And if Moses' pleas are to be read as a cipher for the wandering tribesmen, it seems that everyone is a little fed up with their God. The days of the burning bush, when no one could deny God's overwhelming presence, seems long ago now. And the wandering Israelites, they could have done with a little bit of fire. But from the Lord's hand came only absence and Moses, well, Moses had enough of it. So with a dose of chutzpah heretofore unknown to this once reluctant leader, Moses digs in. He knew the Lord's fidelity to the Israelites, a fidelity that was sealed with the blood of the covenant. He knew that they were known to the deity, knew that they were loved and chosen by God. So Moses demands reciprocity. You know us. Let us know you. Moses wants a burning bush for a fledgling nation, a means by which all could be assured of God's faithfulness. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you. And consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses wanted to know God. The people, they wanted to know. And so do we. 
Moses' demand, it echoes throughout the millennia. God, if you are faithful, if you are present, show yourself. Ours is a world situated in the long shadow of the calf. These many years later, our reverence, our certainty, if we ever had it, has begun to melt away. Where is God, the church cries, as we lose members, as we lose relevance, as we lose money. Where is God as the horrors of history erode our confidence in humanity? Where is God in the petty injustice of day-to-day living? Like Moses, like the Israelites, we long for certainty in this uncertain world. We want the fire in our tents, the pillar in our camps. We want the presence and we want the power. There is a righteous urgency to Moses' arguments. After all, what comes of the covenant if God will not accompany the people? I like to think that Moses' once sure voice now breaks from doubt and anger. So he digs in. If your presence won't go, then neither will your people. And miraculously, God concedes. Moses didn't seem to expect it because he repeats the demand even after God's affirmation, but somewhere it sets in, I will do the thing you ask, says the Lord. And emboldened by his victory, Moses goes a step beyond. Not just the pillar, God, show us your glory. Show the burning bush, the divine face, and then we will follow. Now, glory isn't a particularly easy concept to define. In Hebrew, the word evokes weightiness. Its verb form is literally to be heavy. Elsewhere in the canon, it's translated honor or divine presence. Whatever it is, it seems clear that Moses is demanding that the veil be lifted once and for all. He wants nothing less than for all Israel to see God's most raw form, all of it. I will make all my goodness pass before you, responds the Lord and will proclaim before you the name Yahweh. I am that I am. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Moses demands unmediated revelation, and God gives goodness, a trail of faithfulness and mercy that cuts to the core of the deity. I am that I am. I will be that I will be gracious and merciful. We have spent so much time as a church demanding God's presence that we have failed to see the traces of mercy that everywhere go ahead of us, showing us the edges of the divine will and leading us into the world. We are so busy looking for the fire and the light that we have overlooked the God who weeps in the dark garden, who experiences the forsakenness of creator and creation on the cross. No people, No leader, no tribe can contain the unwieldy freedom of God. God is heavy with it. But if you expect to see God only in light, only in fire, you might start by looking elsewhere. It's not only in our tents. It's not only in our villages. It's not only in our churches. It's there, God, on the edges of society, where basic rights are denied, where the poor are overlooked, where faithfulness has given way to apathy, there is the trace, the hint, the presence, lingering a beat longer than you might expect, and then continuing along the way, almost like a memory on the tip of the tongue one you can only follow to fully understand. What might it mean to our faith 
If we stop searching out burning bushes and parted seas and start following after the shadows. We who urgently ask for God's vindicating presence are precisely those on whom God shows the mercy of the shade. God will show Moses a share of the glory. While my glory, my goodness passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand. But simultaneously, God will protect Moses from his own expansiveness. Because to truly look upon God, unmediated by the tender palm or the resurrected Lord, is to be shown lacking. To look on the deity is to see the righteousness that judges all creation. And that includes us. In turning us away from the full revelation, God shows his willingness to cover our shame and guilt. God protects us from God. We demand the presence and the fire so that we might be known, so that we might know and and we might be vindicated. But before we can choose the fire of our destruction, God chooses for us and the choice is always mercy and graciousness. So it is that Moses finds himself staring squarely at God's hind. Stuck in the crag of a rock, God covers Moses' eyes like a parent, shielding a child from the blinding force of the life-giving sun. And when it's safe, when the cool shadow hangs over the mountain, God lifts his palm and Moses sees the place where the Lord has just been. When my grandfather died, his children all gathered together to inventory the store. My mother told me that you could see everywhere that I had been. You could feel me there, almost, based on this little trail of ancient wrappers, hidden everywhere. You could see, she said, the delight that I took in hiding the wrappers, often just outside of a customer's line of sight or just beyond where my grandfather sat perpetually perched on his stool. It was like an archaeological dig, two layers of wood nails and a light bed of wrappers, three layers further up and a clumped up remnant. I wasn't there, of course, but she said that it wasn't difficult to find me. Just follow this certain childlike nefariousness. It is the very same way that I could and I can feel my grandfather every time I return to that store. Perhaps, perhaps it turns out that we can sometimes all see better in the absence than the presence. This Lent, know that there is value in the trail and in the shadow, in the places where God has just been. Because it is precisely in the shadows that God apportions out mercy. God passes before us in work and action, and though it is not always in the blaze of the burning bush or a voice parting the sky, it is nonetheless visible, a trace that we cannot help but follow. God reveals himself precisely in the places where God seems most hidden. And Anna, your work, this entire church's work is to suss it out, to follow the weightiness, the hint, the suggestion of presence, as First Presbyterian seeks to further engage God's glory in Raleigh and throughout the world. Anna, this congregation already knows you well, and they have instilled in you a great confidence As you know, as we all likely know, there will be times when you will feel this joy, the unique delight of coming alongside God's people to further God's kingdom. But there will also be shadows. Those times when the world is too heavy and you are too weary. When your family needs taken care of and all you want is a cheeseburger. Dig in. It is precisely then that the tender palm of God will cover you, will cover all of us, not with bold assurances, but with the shadow of mercy. It is precisely in the dark crag and doubt and anxiety that we will grow to fuller faith, even as we anticipate the revelation beyond our understanding, 
the light that is to come. The God who is perfectly free has condescended to humanity, not in order to be hidden away in camps and tents and congregations, in theologies and spiritualities, but that he might be perfectly merciful Merciful despite our world weariness, our failings. Merciful alongside our joys and our celebrations. The God of the fire and the God of the shadow has come not to dazzle us with pillars of smoke and bushes ablaze, but to walk ahead of us, to set our feet towards grace and mercy. Your portion, our portion, is to argue it out, to be comforted and challenged by the God of the shadow. To seek that God in crags and pains and wildernesses and deserts. And God will be who God will be. Merciful and gracious. Even unto death. Even death on a cross. Amen. Please be seated. The psalmist reminds us that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Therefore, let us return to God the offerings of our very lives and the gifts of the earth.
Gracious and loving God, you pour out your blessings on us that we might in turn share them with one another. And so heeding your call, we give back to you a portion of that which you have given to us, that it might be used to your glory and for the nurture and care of your people, our neighbors. As we go from this place, let us also seek you where you may be found, following you by displaying the compassion of Jesus to all whom we meet. In your name we pray. Amen. Listen now to these words from Galatians. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling. Today, we gather as the community at First Presbyterian Church and as the Presbytery of New Hope to witness and celebrate the installation of Anna Rainey Dixon as associate pastor for your community, First Presbyterian Church. And in this service, we affirm a three-way relationship with the minister, with the church, and with the presbytery. And so as a witness to this connectional nature which is so unique to our denomination, we appoint commissions, commissions comprised of a diverse representation of our presbytery. So I want to take a moment now and formally introduce the commission to you, those, some of whom you've already heard from and those you will hear from in just a few minutes. I would first like to introduce the Reverend Kathy Church Norman, if you would stand, who is a parish associate at the Kirk of Kildare and a spiritual director. Welcome, Kathy. And Lillian Poole, who you've already heard from, who is a ruling elder at White Memorial Presbyterian Church. Dolores Parker, who is a ruling elder at Davy Street Presbyterian Church. Blake Daniel, who is a teaching elder, minister at White Memorial Presbyterian Church. Bob Barham, who is a ruling elder here at First Presbyterian Church, who I think you know. And I think you also know the Reverend Ed McLeod, who is minister here at First Presbyterian. And we also want to welcome, as a guest of the commission, the Reverend Lee Stuckey, a dear friend of Anna's and associate pastor of the Foothills Presbyterian Church. And I too, Lee, was a fan of Hershey bars. And I don't know if you know this or not, but they now have dark chocolate, so we can eat and be healthy. <laughs> we are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism, and we are marked as Christ's own through the Holy Spirit. And that is our common calling. Anna, when you were first ordained, you made your response to these questions. And from time to time throughout your ministry, you revisit these questions and you reflect on what they really mean as you minister to the people of God. And from time to time, we have the opportunity to revisit these questions at times like this when we install pastors, associate pastors, into their calling. So now I would ask you to please respond to these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, and do you acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? And through him, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. And do you accept the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you, do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confession of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God 
Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church, do you? I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with intelligence, energy, imagination, and love, will you? I will. And will you be a faithful teaching elder, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for the people of God? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? I will. This, our church family, do we, the members of the church, accept Anna as our associate pastor, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? Our response, we do. Amen. Do we agree to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow her as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? We do, we do. Do we promise to pay her fairly and provide for her welfare as she works among us, to stand by her in trouble and share her joy? Will we listen to the word she preaches, welcome her pastoral care, and honor her authority as she seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord? Our response, we do and we will. We do and we will. Now's the time when we get to this one. All right, trying again. Now's the time when we get to invoke the Holy Spirit. We get to pray for Anna and her ministry here. So I want to say a little something about the red that a lot of us are wearing today, and even the choir is wearing it. That's exactly what that means, that we're invoking the Holy Spirit on this celebratory occasion. You see it sometimes at Pentecost. You see it at installations and ordinations. We are asking for the fire and energy and creativity of the Holy Spirit to be here in Anna's ministry and in your ministry with her. And I invite all of you that have been ordained as an elder or as a minister to come forward and we'll lay hands on Anna as we pray. Or lay hands on someone who is laying hands on Anna if you can't get to her. <laughs> so come a little bit closer. Yeah. Yeah. Come on in. Make sure you're touching somebody and she'll feel your energy coming right at her. Yeah? We've got a couple more coming. Anna, just take a look around you real quick so you can see. Yeah? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this moment. This moment when we lay our hands upon Anna Dixon and pray your blessing on her and her relationship with First Presbyterian Church. We acknowledge there's something special going on here between them through you. Gracious God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon Anna. 
bless her, use her, empower her for this work you have called her to. Give her a deep sense of abiding love for you and these your people. Like you did with Moses in the days of old, speak to her and guide her. Give her ears to listen and a heart that longs to obey. When she preaches and teaches and prays, offer her your words. May they become her words. When she visits, serves, and cares, give her your eyes to see what's really going on. Offer her your kindness, patience, and love. May they become hers to share. When she plans, creates, and leads, give her your heart and mind. Offer her your holy imagination. May she become co-creator with you in all that she does. Loving God, as with Moses, we pray that you would give Anna a tent of refreshment where she can get away and be with you. Carve out a place in her life and routine where she can listen to you, wrestle with you, and be challenged to grow. Give her companions, friends, and colleagues that can be in the tent with her sometimes, too, like Joshua was with Moses. We pray that you would give Anna your insight and perspective as she serves you here and serves you with the rest of her life. Help her strike a healthy balance between serving your church and caring for her family and her own needs. And when things get difficult, as they tend to do, or when she feels like she might have gotten too close to your fire, we pray that you would carve out for her a safe place, a cleft in the rock, and that you would cover her with your hand to comfort and protect her until the difficulty and intensity pass. Holy God, we thank you for this moment, for this call to follow Jesus Christ that Anna has been given. Draw her closer to Christ day by day. Help her pattern her life and ministry after his. Help her love like he did and serve like he did. We make our prayers in his name. Amen. I now, I'll just talk loud. I now have the privilege of declaring that Anna Rainey Dixon is officially the associate pastor, your associate pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. Welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, so you didn't think we'd end here without me saying something. Uh, uh, Anna got to choose who did what in this service, and she asked if I would uh, present the charge uh, to her, which uh, uh, I've been itching to do. I didn't get to preach last week, didn't get to preach today, so I've been kind of, I've been loading up. Um, so, um, so this will take a moment. And I've got my script because I don't trust myself to go off script here. In one of his many books, Eugene Peterson wrote this about us, preachers. I don't know of any other profession in which it is quite as easy to fake it as it is in ours. By adopting a reverential demeanor, cultivating a stained glass voice, slipping occasional words like eschatology into our conversation, <laughs> we are trusted without any questions asked, as stewards of the mysteries. It only takes a hint here, a gesture there, an empathetic sigh, or a compassionate touch to convey that we are at home in these deep matters. Even when in occasional fits of humility we disclaim sanctity, we are not believed. And the most public aspects of our work are the easiest to fake. We can borrow sermons from the masters, he says. We can learn to lead liturgy by rote. And we can memorize a half a dozen pious-sounding phrases to suit those occasions when we are asked for a little prayer to get things started just right. So, he suggests, what we do is easy to fake. He's not suggesting that we fake it. 
but he's reminding us, cautioning us, that it's easy to do so. What he's suggesting is that we resist this temptation as a way of staying true to this high and holy calling, this divine claim that has been made on our lives. A little biography. When I was a teenager, I got the job in my community that everybody wanted. I was the lifeguard, which means I got to sit up in the chair, I got to twirl the whistle, I got to exercise absolute authority in my domain. It was a great job. But to this day, I remember a shocking epiphany that changed how I thought about that job. As one afternoon, as I sat in the chair twirling the whistle, it dawned on me that these people are actually trusting me with their lives. Those parents over there in the lounge chairs are trusting me with their children's lives. From that day on, lifeguarding was serious business. In a similar way, early in my ministry, I had another epiphany. That the people who gather on Sunday mornings are expecting from me from me, an encounter with God, a word from God. They were trusting me to have taken God seriously and to have taken their hurts and hungers seriously. And then to stand in the holy, sacred, thin place between God and them. And to speak into that space a word of gospel. And thus my general anxiety about public speaking was now replaced by more specific anxieties. Primarily, what was God thinking? You, Anna, on the other hand, have wonderful gifts of language, of discernment, of seeing what is deep and rich in the text and then inviting us to see it with you. At times, you may not feel up to this high calling, but you are. The rest of us have seen it. But my charge to you is to stay on edge. To remember that this is a sacred calling. It is holy work for real people. Real, hungry, hopeful, hurting, harried people. We'll look to you for a word of promise, a word of truth, a word of consolation. They will look to you for a word of challenge to be their best selves and a word of grace when they realize they aren't. They will look to you to remind them that their life's deepest purpose is in serving God because they live in a world where they're easily distracted. Of course, we can be easily distracted too. So unless you want to take the easy path and fake it, which Peterson says too many of us do, My charge to you is that as you tend to the discipleship of others, tend to your own discipleship first. It is easy to become driven by a to-do list and to measure our productivity and our success by the programs we coordinate. But our most pressing business is keeping these people connected to God. And that's only possible as we stay connected to God. In study, in worship, in times apart, in Sabbath keeping, in prayer and in silent, attentive listening, which are all the things that get crowded out in the busyness of our work. But Eugene Peterson would remind us that it's when we stop tending to the deep cultivation of our own souls that we settle for the appearance of ministry rather than ministry. So my charge to you is keep the sacred work that underlies the sacred calling to which God has clearly called you. So that's the deep stuff. My last charge to you is to delight in these people. I mean really, delight in these people. Because they have surely begun to delight in you. This is a wonderful congregation maybe the best one around. So give thanks for the providence that brought you here and enjoy your ministry here. The truth is this installation seems anticlimactic to us because from the first day you arrived here you have blessed us with your joyful spirit, your authentic warmth, your lively mind, and the ease with which you became a part of who we are. 
which, by the way, made us better than we were. All this installation does is make official what has already been true. For this community of faith has long since welcomed you as a pastor, and they are grateful to God for guiding you to this place, as am I. May God bless you and keep you all the days of your life. Amen. Certainly a gift to be in this pulpit as well, as Lee said. Um, and to get to charge you, this congregation of First Presbyterian Church here in Raleigh, uh, my name is Blake Daniel, and I don't come from far away. I am Anna's um, successor at White Memorial, serving as the current pastoral resident, which Anna did before I did. And so um, not only do I have big shoes to fill there, uh, but I do here. It's great to, to be up here in this pulpit where Anna's preached before. Um, and what a joy it is to be a part of this service of installation. Uh, Ed had me worried for a second because I'm actually going to quote from that same book by Eugene Peterson, which I wish we could uh, claim as collaboration, but um, something else was at work there. It's a great book. Uh, and the quotation that I would like to begin with as I charge you, this congregation, goes like this. And you'll notice similar themes to that passage that Ed just read. Eugene Peterson writes, pastors in America have morphed into a company of shopkeepers, and the shops that they keep are churches. They are preoccupied with shopkeepers' concerns, how to keep the customers happy, how to lure customers away from competitors down the street, how to package their goods so that the customers will lay out more money, end quote. Pastors in America have morphed into a company of shopkeepers, and the shops that they keep are churches. Obviously, these words have something powerful to say to Anna as she's installed as associate pastor today. But again, this charge is for you, the congregation here at First Church. And so, in the interest of time, what I have to say to you all is this, that if pastors are tempted into being shopkeepers in their vocations, then congregations might be tempted into being shops. Shops that are religious or spiritual in nature, of course, but still shops, places where consumerism rules the day, where men and women arrive not to serve but to be served, hoping to have needs met and services rendered so that they can go on with their lives as they see fit. Now, of course, I'm not assuming that you as a congregation are like this, although I don't know you well, I've heard such wonderful things from Anna and from others to not assume this about you. But the temptation is there, and I'm sure you've noticed this, the temptation for you, for us, to forget that we are something different than shops and shopkeepers, that God has called us by his Holy Spirit to be something else, something more, as we follow Jesus Christ together. That God has called us to be the church, to be Christ's body, proclaiming redemption and renewal to a broken world, which is a little bit different than running a shop. And so my charge to you, First Presbyterian, on this day in which we celebrate Anna's call to serve the church and to serve God, is for you to remember your call to be the church, to be Christ's body in the world. And that as a church, you wouldn't contribute to this shopkeeping mentality by copying the practices and pace and ruthless demands of our culture, but that you would recognize the particularity of your life together, a peculiar particularity as Christ's people, a community that is made up of sinners and no one else, a community that together is attentive to God. Now, Anna will certainly have responsibilities that you do not. She will preach and administer the sacraments and go to presbytery meetings and be devoted in season and out of season to serving this church to the best of her ability. But this is not a license for you as a congregation to sit back 
as recipients of her faithfulness and good works. But on the contrary, your call is to come alongside her as brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray for her as she prays for you, to encourage her as she encourages you, to remind her of her calling to seek the face of Jesus in all things as she does this for you week in and week out. And of course, Anna has specific tasks ahead of her, tasks that are unique to this calling uh, of associate pastor, tasks like sharing life with young adults here in Raleigh, of exploring new and creative ways of sharing the gospel with this city. This is why she is being installed as your associate for young adults and evangelism. And yet she should not bear all of those burdens alone. The challenge of reaching out to the young adults of Raleigh falls on each of you as well, as the church community, as you as a church strive to make space for young adults in your midst, to include them in your life together. And the challenge of bearing witness to the gospel in the world through evangelism and outreach and mission falls on each of you as well, as we remember that Jesus' great commission applies to the entire church. This is the beautiful challenge of our doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that even as Anna has been set apart for special service in Christ's church, she joins with you as the church in living out the mission of God here in the world. And so, my friends, let Anna be your pastor by being the church. Be devoted to Jesus Christ in your own lives and be devoted to this body in ways that ask much of you in ways that humble you and challenge you. And in so doing, Anna will have the traction that she needs to walk alongside you, as well as to lead you and to guide you and to be your pastor in the days and months ahead. And of course, just love her. Love her and CJ and this baby to come. Be generous to them. Take care of them. Remember that Anna is like you, a humble sinner in need of a wonderful Savior. And so I give thanks to God that you have each other. Amen.
Go forth this day with hope and with peace and be led back in peace. Go in the knowledge that in the goodness of God you were born. In the providence of God you are kept all the days of your life. And in the love of God fully revealed in Jesus Christ, you and I, we are redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen.